All right, well, I have a question for Martha White from Arkansas. My mother just uh, sent me a text. She said, how, how, do you, how do your employees know that they're valued? Oh, first of all, hello. <laughs> All right, you ready? I love vacation yeah. with me. Don't That's forget what I'm talking about. Think travels. <laughs> All right, Ty, you ready? Yeah. Time out. <laughs> Tyler, who are we taking a time out with today? Oh, howdy, Kevin. We got Dr. Sean L. Hawkins, uh, Hawkins today, uh, president and CEO of Urban League. Dr. Sean L. Hawkins, thanks for being with Kevin and I. We're just two curious guys wanting to know more and more about the great leaders in the Rochester area. And we'll start it off. Dr. Shinell, what gets you out of bed in the morning nowadays? After everything you've done in life, you're a president, CEO. How do you still get out of bed with all that ambition and attitude and get stuff done? It's the mission of the work that I do, that we do at the Urban League. It's, it's the mission. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. That gets you fired up. I love that. All right, so when you're cruising into work, right, you're, you're preparing for your first big board meeting, what song is on max volume in your car? It's always anything from Biggie. Notorious right. Biggie, it's got to be, that's what I'm playing, those are my hype songs, um, or anything, yeah, anything Biggie, Jay-Z, that's, that's my music. All right, love it. Love it. All right. Staying in uh, music. So let's say, uh, are you uh, for karaoke night, open mic night, Dr. Sean Elf getting on the show? Are you singing Biggie, Jay-Z, or what song would you sing from a karaoke perspective? All right. So first of all, I've never done karaoke before. Just saying. Never, ever, ever. Um, <laughs> don't think I would. But if I had to, it would be MC Light, Paper Thin, um, way back in the day but it has like a, the beat where you can do your own version of it and you know when i'm in my element i have my own rap going on and <laughs> <laughs> all right she's freestyling now Ty. She's freestyling. <laughs> all right so what uh we're, we're gonna we're gonna say one thing what is one thing your employees might not know about dr sean l hawkins what they I used to want to be a rapper back in the days. Queen Supreme was my name. That's who I wanted to be. Queen Supreme. Queen Supreme. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not too late. It's never too late. Dude, we can wow. make people off her, off her crowd, man. Right? You know? Queen it's too late. Supreme. It's too late. Well, Dr. Shadow, who's your favorite athlete? My favorite athlete? I, I love boxing. I love boxing. So... Right now, I don't know. It's kind of up in the air. It's kind of up. Right now, Clarissa Shields, I mean, she's one of my favorites. She went into MMA boxing, too, so she's fighting on June 5th. I really want to see that fight. I'm excited about Pacquiao and Errol Spence fighting. Um, so, but I love boxing. I don't watch any other sport but boxing. That's that's my... All right. Yeah, I love sports. Well, I got to ask them, what do we think about Mayweather coming out of retirement to fight this uh, white guy uh, that's never really I boxed think in the ring before? he's staying retirement. I think... That's what you know, I'm saying. He should stay in retirement. <laughs> yeah, finish undefeated. That's what I, yes. I'm like, who is this? I don't even know the guy's name. I'm like, why would he even fight this guy? Listen, but, do you remember when Bernard Hopkins came out of retirement and, and he fell out of the ring and he was like, yeah, you don't yeah, want that be, to happen to me. Yeah, don't mess up the yeah. legacy. Stay yeah, exactly. in retirement. Continue to promote other folks. Keep, you know, money Mayweather. But yeah, stay in retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Get to learn a lot about uh, some of the movies that people watch. What is the most inspirational movie to you? Inspirational? I don't know if it's inspirational, but for me it is. You know, 300. That's my movie. 300 Ooh. you can't do this work alone you need a good leader but you need an army and you need to be strong and that is it when i i've watched 300 i don't know how many times countless times um but that is my inspiration um and when i really want to be inspired apocalypto i don't know if you've ever seen that by yep. mel gibson but if you haven't seen it tyler you have to see it um, that is an inspirational movie. It's just about one man's journey to saving his his people, his family, and it, it's inspiring to me. 
Yeah. Noted. Yeah. Noted. Yeah. Just don't show that to your it. kids, Tyler. Don't show that to no, so don't Dexter show it to your up. kids. They might have some <laughs> nightmares. You did have heads going across the screen, but it's definitely a good one. So, Sean, now I was talking to one of your friends today, Norma Holland. And, oh, I uh, love Norma uh, Holland. Uh, love she's Norma a sweetheart. Holland. She's a sweetheart. She took me out to King and I, and uh, she was she was blown away by the the spicy scale that I got over there. <laughs> but uh, she, I'm, I'm, my wife and I are expecting in July, July first, well, our first baby. Congratulations! All right. Well, now it's now it's go time. So I need some yes. parental advice. What what it what do you is. got for me from a parenting advice? What do you what well, do you got? You know, I have a two year old Kevin, and I'm still struggling. But we just got through potty training. I feel really good. I feel good. But enjoy it. Enjoy it. Just enjoy right. it. Don't let anyone shame you. To doing things that the way they did it just do what works best for you and your wife and that's the best advice that i could give you thank you i'm writing all that down all right dive in a little bit dr Chanel. um so you're a president and a ceo of a company and that's something i tell all of these leaders that that i can't even imagine doing that like or being asked to do that or being anywhere involved do you remember when and where you were when you found out you were gonna be a president and CEO of a company? Oh, I know where I was. I know when it was. I was um, teaching at Brockport. I was adjuncting, teaching my family life class. And I saw the board members call on my phone and I was like, oh, oh my goodness. I'm gonna to have to give them an assignment really quickly so I can go out in the hallway and take this call. So I'm like, okay, here's some busy work and let me go out and take that call. And it was just really exciting when I got the offer. Who was the first person you you called? Yeah. The first person I told. You know what? I held it. I held it because I had I had my class waiting, so I had to hold on to that. And on the way home, I called my dad, who was no longer with us, but I called my dad. He was. I didn't even tell my. I don't think my husband even knows this that he wasn't the first person. (laughs) But I Uh called my dad and let Uh my dad know. Should we cut that out? Should we cut that out? I know you have to cut that part, right? (laughs) Cut that out. (laughs) So when you were assuming that role as a leader, um, was there any anxiety, stress, or did did all the? I I know you got your master's as well as your doctorate, um, in, in in a multitude of executive leadership courses. Were you, did you feel like you were prepared to take on that challenge? First of all, lots of anxiety, worry. You want to do the right thing. I was the first female to take on the role um, in the, in the 55 year history of the urban league. So, you know, that felt really heavy, like, okay, you're going to have to do your thing here and, and really prove that you know what you're doing. But then I kind of just calmed down and remember all of the experiences that I had prepared me for this role here. And so I I just had to lean in on that. And St. John Fisher College prepared me to be the very best executive leader I could be. And then all of those things that I've done in the past just readied me for this. So I was was eager to take it on and then making sure that I had the right team to help me do the work because it's not just you. You know, sometimes you, you know, obviously from the, the community, it looks like it's you, but there's a whole team behind you making sure that we can fulfill the mission of the organization. So I'm grateful to my team for that. What is your personal mission statement? Oh, my personal mission statement is to be accountable to my team, accountable accountable to the community, to be the very best executive leader that I possibly can be, to always demonstrate integrity, um, and, and to have full transparency and provide the best opportunities for our community and always think with that in mind and not be selfish about my own personal gains, but about what's best for the community. And would you say that's that's uh, Urban League's mission statement in a way too? You know what it is, the Urban League's mission statement is to ensure that everyone, anyone that's been marginalized secures economic self-reliance, wealth, have access to housing, um, also, first of all, make sure there's parity, power, no barriers to civil rights. And that's just who I am. I want to make sure I'm fighting for that. So that's what gets me up every day. That's what gets me charged. I have a lot of energy always. So thankfully I do. And it, it just charges me to do this work. 
probably why your employees are so motivated to work with with you or for you. Um, but I'm actually yeah. motivated by them because they are, we have a Zoom meeting every Friday where we all get together. First of all, COVID has really changed how we do things at the Urban League. But I love that every Friday now we have a staff meeting at 12 o'clock from 12 to one, we're all on Zoom, our cameras are on, and this is our time for community brainstorming, getting to know each other. We have an Urban League unofficial DJ, DJ Todd. Oh. Yes. And at the end of the meeting, he always gives us a hype song to lead the meeting with. And it's just great. It is and then Queen great. Supreme gets on the mic at the Queen end. Queen Supreme has drop. not blessed them yet. No, no, no. <laughs> hey, you might get a lot of fans at, uh, at the, after this. So they, you maybe might have a special start, Maybe if this goes well, I'll have like a Queen Supreme debut or something. I don't know. <laughs> I will be there front row with popcorn and bells on. <laughs> Oh, uh, so um, one of the things that I know you, you, you've really focused on strategic leadership and, and have learned, obviously, from your master's degree to your doctorate. Um, what are some things that you learned in the classroom that did not pan out into real life? Oh, some things that I've learned in the classroom. You know what? Relationships are everything. And I don't think in the classroom you really learn how to navigate political relationships um, and just relationships in general. Um, we talk about the importance of, but we're really navigating that. And I had to learn that, you know, how to, when you make a connection, you stay good with that connection. You also continue to nurture that relationship, whether it be with donors, how do you make sure that donors are happy? How will you steward those relationships? You don't learn that in college. It, you learn that from experience. So I've learned that. I've learned that. And I, I, I don't think I've got, don't tell, don't tell Fisher and don't tell Nazareth that I said that. Not Nazareth, um, Roberts Wesley. And I also took some classes at Nazareth too, but don't tell them I said that. But definitely um, navigating relationships is critical to your success, especially board relationships, relationships with your your um, partners definitely we learn how to navigate staffing relationships but but those external partners are critical mm -hmm. man and yeah, I, I always tell people that you know i failed my way into relationships dr sean um and, and Tyler you know White i was gonna say kevin is a master at that he connects with someone and then he connects that someone to you and to someone else and you should teach a class on that, Kevin, because you do that really well. Really, I took well. his AP class. It was a, it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's what it's all about, right? Giving back to the giving back to others and not expecting anything in return. And I think that's really where you start to check your ego at the door and realize that uh, everybody has something to teach us. Talking about mentors, Dr. Sean Allen, I'm sure you've met a ton of different leaders from the courses, from your work in college, as well as like the Think Smart Academy. Who is a mentor for you and, and, and kind of who do you look up to? I have a list. I really have All a right. long list of mentors. So I would say um, first, not first on my list, but I'll begin my list. No particular order, um, but Essie Calhoun McDavid, um, um, I'm sorry, not Essie, um, I would say Essie Calhoun McDavid, um, Phil Johnson, um, D.T. Ogilvy, Dr. D.T. Ogilvy, um, there's a long list, Dr. Mike Wisnowski, Marie Sianca. I mean, there's so many people that, that I connect with on the regular, Jerome Underwood, that just really are support and, and helpful. And so I appreciate when you can call someone and say, hey, I'm going through this. What are your thoughts? You know, mm -hmm. can I run this by you? This is what I'm experiencing. And it's, it's powerful to have that. Um, Peter Carpino has been that for me as well. So lots of great people that have had great roles or have great roles in the community um, have been helpful. So I would say that would be just a few, but I have a long list. And then I have like good friends. You always need a good friend to tell you, mm -mm, don't do that. <laughs> you didn't look good when you did that. Don't ever wear that again. You know, you need that too in your life. In addition to the, the business expertise, you need a good friend to say, why did you wear that hairstyle? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need new friends. Yeah, oh, you God. need those friends that can 
and tell you the truth. And so I, I appreciate that because I'm that for my friends. I'm, I'm that truth teller. So yeah. I have well, that. Yeah. I have a, a few friends that will do that for me. Then I have my, you know, my nerdy friends that I just want to get into research with. And that is my friend, Dr. Joshua Fagley, when I'm just like, let's go to the library. And he's all in and we can stay there all day and we have a good time. So there are lots of people that I say I connect with in, on different levels. And then you always have, for me, I have to have that spiritual friend when days really get tough, like, please pray for me. I need you to pray for me right now. And so I have a good girlfriend that she, she's that for me too. It sounds like you surround yourself by the best of the best over there, Dr. Sean Howard. To. I'm so grateful to meet great people like yourselves and just to stay connected with them. And I need when I need them, they're there for me. And I just try to do the same for them when I can. Oh, man. Well, all right. Well, I have a question from Martha White from Arkansas. My mother just uh, sent me a text. She said, how, how do you how do your employees know that they're valued? First of all, hello, <laughs> all the way from Arkansas. Hello, thank you for listening. <laughs> um, I think that one, making sure to let employees know that they're valued is one, eliminating hierarchies. Like I just not all for that. You know, I appreciate you all calling me Dr. Charnel, but we, they can call me Sean. They can come into my office and say, hello, you want to meet with me? Most of them have my cell phone number, text me. I want to be in relationship with you. And so it doesn't matter that I'm the CEO, let's be in relationship. I, I like learning about them and knowing what they like and calling them out on, you know, on our Zoom meetings and getting to know them. Like, what are you guys doing? What are you watching? What's happening? So I think that's one thing. And then listening to them, when we bring ideas um, in, like interrupt racism. When interrupt racism was just began as a crazy idea that I had, I shared it with a couple of people, like a couple of my mentors, Frederick Jefferson, Dr. Frederick Jefferson. I shared it with him. I shared it with my friend, my nerdy friend. I shouldn't call him that, right? He's super smart. Though. Watch Doctor, and don't don't play that. He'll like nerdy, really? Am I nerdy? <laughs> <laughs> but Dr. Joshua Fagley, I shared it with them. And then the, the, I shared it with my team. I shared it with my team. Actually, before I shared it with them, we, had, we talked about it at a staff meeting to help me develop this idea. And so I think that shows that you value the staff where you want to hear their voice, where you want their input. And it's not just something coming from me. I value what they say. And that's how we got to this initiative. That's amazing. I love you to dive in because uh, I'm sure I'm sure everybody's interested in this and, and, and being in your role and kind of through a pandemic um, very early on in your 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 tenure there at the Urban League of Rochester and I know um, from conversations with you that you kind of stepped into the role after an individual had been in there for quite some time so some big shoes to fill. Absolutely. What was your first? What was the first thing that you did as a leader? First of all, let me say I had to follow Bill Johnson, who was the mayor. And, and Bill Clark, who was there for 30 years and the first woman. And so I, I definitely had a lot on my plate. But um, the first things that I did, um, first of all, was I, I needed to get with the staff and learn what was successful and what we were doing. So really get strategic. But during the COVID crisis, we, you know, we were an organization that frowned upon working, not working from home. And so we had to quickly change that within three days we did that and really stay connected with the team. So again, this is now going back to those relationships, lots of training, lots of staying connected. So I learned that that really helped us to get to where we wanted to go. Um, and our staff, just the passion of the staff and hearing that and, and letting them know, hey, this is happening. Do you know that people are experiencing this problem? Okay, let's brainstorm and let's respond to that. And that's how we were able to, one, stay on top of um, PPE equipment for the community members, know what was happening with entrepreneurs and, and was able to, to leverage our relationships and get additional dollars for, we gave away 138 Grant 138 grants of up to $10,000 to small businesses. And that was through our relationship with ESL and KeyBank um, biz, um, Business Boost and Build Power by Jumpstart. So ESL gave a $300,000 $300, contribution 
to make sure that we could help small businesses and, and key bank um, business boost and build, they gave us $100,000. So we were able to leverage those relationships um, to help small businesses. But that was only because our team, they were connected to what was happening in the community and we were able to respond. So again, relationships, having that back and forth feedback flow with the, with the, with the staff and we knew what was happening and we were able to respond. The transparency, the communications, the being involved in the community. I mean, those are and in creating a safe space where people feel comfortable and confident that no idea is a bad idea. And I think that's so amazing to hear that um, you mentioned the hierarchical structure and why it's like for the birds now, because you're, you're missing the boat that you have so much intellectual capital with, within your employees because they're so entwined with the community. They know the needs of the community. Right now, obviously, um, Rochester, what do you think that we need to do as a community to really kind of build bridges? Break down silos. Number one answer for me, break down silos that we need to have formed relationships between for-profits and not-for-profits, understand our shared mission, and together work to create a more equitable Rochester. And we've been sort of doing that work. We've be, um, been facilitating conversations. We provided a training to the Power 100, the RBJ Power 100 group, we offered this three hour groundwater training to help um, individuals understand what we meant when we talked about systemic racism. Then we had some follow up meetings where we just began to have some conversation and we're doing that work now and it feels good to just have these conversations across the different fields and, and we'll still have to continue to lift that work invite more people to come to the table I, I encourage you all to come to the table. Our next meeting is June 21st, but we want to continue to do that and break down silos so that we can truly create a more equitable Rochester. That is the work that we have to do. Oh, golly. <laughs> Sounds like a plan, Dr. Sean. Man, you, you are on a mission. I'm on a mission, but I'm not on a mission by myself. And that's the, the most powerful part. You have to do your personal work and then bring other people on, you know, learn, understand what the work you have to do and then inform your network and bring a new team in and, and have that team tell others so your team can get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's how you fulfill the mission. I wanna come work for you. Um, All right, so let's do it. <laughs> let's do, let's do, I can't wait for the meeting on June 21st. I think uh, Tyler and I will both be there for that. Oh, I'm excited, What's thank up? you. If you had um, to tell yourself, I guess, uh, now that you're, you, you made it, right, you're in that executive leadership role, this is seemingly what you've worked your entire life to get to. What would you tell your younger self now? Like, what is something you wish you knew when you were, you were growing up? Mm, that, that's a good thing. Um, a good question. I would say I would tell myself to keep doing what you're doing. I made a lot of mistakes along the way. I was a teenage mom. I had a, a baby. I went to high school with my baby with me. So I made a lot of mistakes, but all of those things prepared me for who I am. So I would say to my younger self, don't beat yourself up. It is going to be okay. All of these things that you're learning are going to strengthen you and ready you for the work that you're about to do. But I probably would tell myself to leave myself to leave a couple of people maybe a year or two earlier, like leave him alone. This is not <laughs> <hand> out. <laughs> but that would probably be my best advice to myself that you're on the right pathway. So so being a younger mom in, in high school, it's a it's a reality. Uh, mistakes happen, whatever whatever happens, right? Um, uh, sometimes I, I'm sure I, I missed a full dodged a, a few bullets there. What, um, I guess when you, when you were kind of <laughs> going through that same, same thing, how does, how does that help you be, be a more effective leader? Does it help you be more understanding? Like how, how do you think? I, I think it helps you become more empathetic because you understand the struggle. You've been through the struggle. You've been through that. You know what poverty is. You know what it's like to be a single parent trying to make ends meet, working and going to school and having kids. You get that. And you know the work that's put in, but you also know the supports that are necessary. 
I know that I could not have made it without mentorship. So I know that I, if someone asked me to mentor them or be connected to them, I'm going to do that because that was what helped me learning and seeing other women in professional positions with my similar story and saying, okay, they did it. I can do it. And so before I, I almost had some, some shame about being a single, you know, young teenage parent. And I didn't want to tell people that that was my story, but that is my story. And if it could inspire others to say, you can do it because I'm not just, I, I didn't just get here. I had to work really, really hard and it will cost you a lot of blood, sweat and tears, but you can do it because I did it. That's and awesome. I wasn't the most that. motivated person in school. I, you know, when I look back at my report cards and, and when I see people, I, I do a lot of work with um, equity in New York City where we were before COVID. And I met some, this gentleman whose wife was my teacher, my English teacher. And I'm like, I don't know if I should have told them that I was his, his wife's student because she might be like, oh, she was horrible. <laughs> but, you know, I had a lot of energy and a lot of teachers didn't know what to do with all of that energy. But when I look back, you know, I didn't have the best grades. But once I had my baby, I became very focused. I doubled up in school and I was able to graduate six months earlier than my class, even though I had a baby. But I became very focused. And, and I knew what I wanted to do. And I was driven to get there. Man, well, yeah, you were. I think <laughs> your time management skills must be off the charts. You know, I am such a timekeeper. I, I, we, when we have our groundwater meetings, those are the meetings that I was sharing with you about with the Power 100. They're 45 minute meetings. And we stick to the time. And so I'm very much a timekeeper. I have to have good time management skills. And I have a two-year-old at home, so she demands my time. So if it starts going too long, I have to give her my time, and then I can put her to sleep and then do some work. But I have to be really cautious of that and, and have strong time management skills. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Well, you're you're just an awesome, awesome example. You know, you give, I think you give folks, uh, especially young women, a slice of hope. You know, if they've been in that situation before, that experience before that you've been in, came through, got stronger, stronger, still have all this energy, have a two-year-old CEO, president, doesn't phase you, you know, and I know you're giving me hope, but I don't have any kids. <laughs> uh, this is, I feel lazy now. Um, <laughs> what I'm trying to, trying to ask you, I think, is uh, what advice would you give young ladies out there that may be in that same situation that are bashful? that are scared, that are just don't want to come out and say, hey, I'm, you know, have a kid or, or any, any of the matters, you know, I think just, we're so vulnerable when we're young and scared, fearless and scared at the same time. I just would like to know your advice for the young ladies out there. Yeah, I, I think that's such a great question. And I would say, you know, we all feel self-doubt. We all feel worried about the future, but taking that energy and, and really making a plan. One of the things that I would say is, one thing that I've done for a long time is I always have a vision board, like right in front of me right now is my vision board. And so I always, if you don't see, if you don't believe your future or see the future, you can't really achieve it. And I know that kind of sounds corny, but it is what, like when I put that up and I look at it every day and I look up and I see what I, what I plan to focus on, I can achieve that. So I would tell that young woman that where you are today is only temporary very temporary. But the work that you put in, the vision that you set forth, you will achieve it. And make sure you connect to the right people, the right organizations. And it's all about, as I've hopefully demonstrated, relationships, organizations, you know, mentorship, all of that is going to help you get to that pathway. And I didn't know that before. I, I thought once you got to a CEO position, you were just doing it on your own. I didn't know that other CEOs had mentors and folks that think coaches and that they were working with. And, and, and that's something that we have to share. So you know that you just don't get there and you're on your own. There's folks along the way that are committed to your success. So where you are today is just temporary. Envision where you want to be tomorrow and begin to chart that pathway and connect with the right people that can get you there. Golly, that is excellent advice for those young ladies out there, Dr. Sean. And how about, how about advice for white guys in their 30s? Catching up. <laughs> 
from your from your from your lens, Doctor Shen, how can we be I, how, how can we build bridges? What do you see in us? Listen, what advice do you give me, Kevin, right, and Ben? Look at us. We all look like white bread. Ah, you know what I. <laughs> white bread okay <laughs> i appreciate that and i i really appreciate this question because i would like fellas like yourself gentlemen like yourself tyler and kevin to really you leverage your privilege leverage your relationships and your networks to really begin to create a more equitable community that is what we have to do and so if you can make those connections, if you can really leverage your skills to create new partnerships that benefit the community, that's what we need. That's what we need. Just what you're doing right now, creating opportunities to share my story or for others to share their leadership stories. But we have to also think about equity in our leadership work because it's critical. And that's how we change and that's how we create a better unite, you know, a, a America, right? United States. This is how we become better. But right now we're focused on just Rochester, but this is, this is how we do our work. Rochester, I believe Rochester can be the example of how you create a more equitable community. Just I'm these on board for that. coming together. Kevin, I believe that you and Tyler can help do that. Absolutely. Right. Sign us up. I, All right. I'm, I'm signing up. you up. I want to see you on the 21st. Absolutely. Yeah, I will be there. I'm, right. Tyler and I are going to be there. I All mean, right. baby willing, right? So hopefully the baby is, stays put until the July okay. 1st. Oh, yes, because your wife would not appreciate you saying, I'm up at a meeting. No. <laughs> Just I want like you, you know to stay you're married, married, Kevin. Stay married. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you're on the marriage topic, I got to ask you, what is what What do you think your husband loves most about you? Oh, that's a great question. I, I think he would love that I'm adventurous. If like we got married in 90 days. Yes, oh. <laughs> and, and then we said the other day that we should have been on married at first sight. Maybe we could have got paid for this or been, or been on 90 day fiance or something, but you know, I think that he loves that, you know, I'm a risk taker. I'm such a risk taker. Um, and he loves that. And he, he's kind of, you know, regimented. He doesn't like to do anything spontaneous. If I say, oh, tomorrow we're going here. He's like, oh, uh, I got, I got things to do. I don't think I can do that. I'm like, no, we're going. And he's like, okay, okay. So um, I think that's what he likes most about me. I bring a little adventure to his life. Yeah, definitely. You're the that's why yin and yang is you yes, each other out, yes. you, you help each other along. And he's so, my reality just, check too. He's he's definitely my reality check. And so I appreciate that. So understanding obviously you're 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 in a role of of, of power, of authority. Um typically it, it, it as America would have it, um very rare, like you said, you're the first woman over at the Urban League of Rochester. How, how did that change your relationship or how did your husband start to support you in a different way? Because it's different from what we've been accustomed to our whole lives. How did he support you? Uh, he did a lot of listening, um, a lot of allowing me to just process things, especially, you know, figuring out, going through strategic plans and, and thinking very strategically about how you turn an organization around or um, really think about the mission of creating a more equitable Rochester. Um, a lot of listening, a lot of listening, a lot of just allowing me to say, and not, you know, not a lot of um, criticism, just listening. So that's how he supported me. And I appreciate that. That's awesome. Amazing. And he encourages me. He encourages me. Now he might say, well, you know, in that interview, I, I want you to wear something different. <laughs> he might do that too. <laughs> I got to get a look at this wardrobe because everybody's <laughs> picking on you from a clothes selection. So you must be all over the map. I Man. am. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and Dr. Shiloh, I was just wondering, what's on your vision board today? When you today, brought it up, I, I didn't know what's on there. Today on my vision board, it says to eat healthy. I'm on a weight loss journey. So it has the amount of weight that I want to lose. Um, I want to be tough, bold, and badass. That's on my vision board. I want to have triple the love, triple the joy. There's a lot of other things on there. A stronger marriage, um, enlarge my territory. That's a phrase in the Bible. 
Um, and so those are things that are on my vision board. A lot more, but th that's what I want to share publicly, right? Yeah, enlarge my territory. I like that. <laughs> How does how does your faith how do you how do you bring in faith to what you get to do every day and, and and really probably I mean serve the community in which we all live? It's a huge part of everything that I do. When I wake up in the morning, I pray. I thank God for just blessing me to wake up and do this work. Um, and and even as I'm doing it, I just don't want to do it out of my own thoughts. Even though I've learned and I've been prepared for this, but I still feel like there's a spiritual guidance that that helps me navigate, mm, don't do this, do that, you know, have these conversations and those things that you don't want to do, you know, that really give you the courage to do the things that you don't like doing and you still mm. have to do them. And so it's that push that, that I get and that I appreciate. And I, I couldn't do it without, you know, my faith. I was going to say, you know, you're a lady who needs like, if I could ask you this, if I could give you $500 billion, what would you do with it if you couldn't spend a dollar on yourself? Oh, I got a whole list. I would <laughs> build the, I'm, I'm telling you, one of the things that we've been talking about at the Urban League is building a community with support. Um, and so really been thinking a lot about the Tulsa massacre, which we're coming up on the 100 year anniversary. But if you look at this community in Greenwood, there was a community that was filled with um, black entrepreneurs, hospitals, businesses, everything that you needed from the library. And how can we create that in Rochester and begin to eliminate poverty? And so if we had that amount of money, we create more home ownership, more home ownership opportunities, have more entrepreneurs, have hospitals that are really sensitive to the needs of the community and that can focus on that really focus on career aspirations and helping people that are just like, I want to do something else, but I can't afford to do that. And, and partnering with organizations that could help them really get their career to the next level. So it wouldn't be us, but it would be the incentivizing of everyone to pull their resources together to do this and create this community and then keep replicating and keep replicating it in Rochester until we don't have any more poverty. That's what I would do, not spending a dime on myself, but we would create a powerful, powerful, rich, rich, wealthy Rochester where everyone is thriving, doing well, and how much happier would we all be? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I want in my community. I want to know my neighbors. I want to know what they're up to. And it, I, something you said earlier is you get to know your employees on an individual basis. And that probably changes your whole intention um, of, of how you approach those types of relationships. If you could write a book yourself, what would it be about and what would you title it? Mm, that's a good question. I probably would entitle it, you think you know, I know I'm stealing this from MTV, right? But you think you know, but you have no idea. Because I think that's my story. Because I think when you see the appearance, you might think, okay, this is Dr. Shawnell Hawkins. But you don't really know my journey of how I've gotten here. And so I would share that journey. So that's what it would be around. I know you gave us a little little tidbit uh, of, of where you were um, uh, kind of growing up in high school and going through those various challenges, but I mean, that's probably made you one of the most resilient people out there. Um, you've been there, you've done that. How do you inspire your employees to always want to, I guess, learn more or be their best selves? Is that, is that a little with the work that you do? Um, at yeah, that I mean, we encourage them to be their authentic self. Like that's important to be, because I show up every day as my authentic self. I show up unapologetically. I don't try to change my voice, my accent. This is me with this Brooklyn accent that you may or may not hear, but I, I show up as myself. I don't try to be fake or phony or who people think I should be. And I want that, I want the same thing for my team because I think you get their real perspective. And I want to know if things aren't going well, tell me, tell us so that we can fix it. Um, I don't wanna hear that everything is perfect all the time. If it's not right, let's fix it so we can make it right. But we want people to be happy so that they have a long tenure um, and they can make sustainable change in the community. I mean, that's what it all comes down to. And people can't do that if they have, if they don't feel like they can be, you know, in, you know, them, their selves, if they have to pretend to be something other than they are. So I encourage that. 
Plenty of pretenders out there. Plenty. No pretenders. Uh, one, one thing I had a, 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 um, a question on. Um, so you're talking about, obviously, the relationships that you've been able to develop. It's a strong culture. Um, what you learned in executive leadership, what do you think is the most fundamental building block of creating a culture like you have so quickly there at the Urban League? Mm. Well, I, I think one, the reputation of the Urban League is, is powerful. People want to partner with the Urban League because of who we are, who we've been branded as. We're a national organization that supports businesses, entrepreneurs, adults with disabilities, youth education, um, we support home ownership, um, affordable housing, family, equity and advocacy. So, I mean, folks want to connect to that, right? Folks want to be partnered with organizations that are thriving and doing well. So I, I most certainly say it all doesn't come from me. It comes from the history of who the Urban League is, is and who they've been to this community for the last 50, 56 years. But it also is where they see us going, right? They see the work that we're doing. Um, especially our work to interrupt racism, our work we're building 41 new affordable housing units, their rent to own. This is something new. We're the first ones in New York to bring this here. So they see the progress. They see that we're, we're on this journey. And, and so the mission, our mission is to fulfill the mission and shut the Urban League down. I know that's really provocative, but it's to close the Urban League. We want to close the Urban League. We want to be to a place at a place where no one needs us anymore, or at least not in the same way. They only need us maybe for, you know, some support or maybe some training, but not the way they need us today. So I, I think that's the foundation, just the branding of who we are, our mission, what we've been doing, our long history, and then where we're going and where you see us going. Got some vision right there, and and you you put the action in too, Dr. Chanel. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're a force to be reckoned with. And my next yeah. question to you is going to be, where do you see yourselves in 2050 over there? And it sounds like to me, you, you don't even want it to Close. exist. Close. <laughs> I, I want that building to be for sale with the sign that says, "with says close" and with a for sale sign. That's the mission. <laughs> Check in with me, 2050. Yeah. All right. All right, we will, we will. I'm gonna hold you up to that. Yeah. Um, as we're kind of wrapping up here, uh, a couple other questions. If you had to describe yourself, Dr. Sean Allen, one word, what would that one word be? Oh, that's a good question. Determined. Determined. I hear that in everything that you've said. So everything far. that I do. Even when someone says you're not going to do it, I'm like watch. <laughs> how do you then define success you know success it depends on what it is you know it depends on what it is but one achieving the goal um making sure that there's a vision and that people are sharing in that vision and that's and and, and when you have that i think you'll ultimately get to the goal I mean, some things you're not going to achieve success on tomorrow and just having to recognize that and know that, you know, our, our goal is to interrupt racism and eventually eliminate racism, but I know that's not going to happen tomorrow. But are we successful in the work we do? Absolutely, because we're bringing, we're educating, we're helping other people understand their role, their leadership role that they must take to interrupt racism. Um, and so I, I believe that that's still success, you mm -hmm. know, as we see uh, more opportunities opening for us to create home ownership in Rochester, that's success. You know, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. So you have to have, you know, understand the journey, understand the pathway, but you know, you're, you're successful along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and the team will tell you if you're not being successful or my team will let me know like mm, okay we've got work to do <laughs> it's like you were saying with your best friends though that you like that feedback right Is i do i want it sometimes. i want it I, I, if, if if the team doesn't believe in it then you know the community won't believe in it so you have to make sure it's right internally before you project that that messaging or that initiative um, before you share it, you have to make sure it's right internally. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, what a way to test it out, right? Yes, absolutely. Test it with your team of your, of your trustees. And then if it doesn't work with them, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. I believe in that for everything. I call them critical friends. You ask your critical friends about this is what I'm thinking. What are you, what are you thinking? Um, it, it's important to test it out because you want one, you don't want it to get into group think and you don't want to think your idea is so great. And then when you share it with someone, they're like, yeah, that's not that great. <laughs> what? <laughs> but you need to know these things. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that's so important too, because like we could think it's the greatest di idea in the world. And then you, you get to pitch it on some people and they're like, no, you're way off. Way uh, off. I don't see the value in that yeah. one. Um, so uh, I and I know Tyler asked uh, what us us white boys can do to to really facilitate some of these conversations, <laughs> but um, one thing I wanted to ask you is what do you think is I guess the root cause of of racism? I have I have my opinion and I think it's a real lack of understanding. It's afraid of the unknown. It's somebody that looks different than themselves, but. That's my opinion, um, because I, I could have very easily ended up in that white America world as I grew up and I went to Catholic schools my whole life, but my parents allowed me to go to public school for high school. And that was where it was, I had that eye-opening moment. But what do you think is, is really one of the fundamental reasons of it? Um, and I guess if we understand that, then we understand how we could potentially combat that. Yeah, that is just such a deep question. So let me just say that, you know, racism, when I think of racism, I think of it as the oldest business practice, right? That's been around in America because it was rooted on land, money, people, slavery, all those things. And to, to create um, wealth for another group, that's just deep in itself. And then with that, these practices and these systems that were created to benefit one group and harm another, or keep another back have been in our in our history, United States history for well over 400 years. And so having that understanding, and even when, when we talk about privilege and people get upset sometimes, or, you know, I don't have any, yes, you do it. And, and so that's such a deep question that there's a lot of work in learning and unlearning that has to happen. We have to relearn our history because it wasn't told in its entirety, right? Lots it's were left like, out. It's like the UK doesn't probably talk about the Revolutionary War. They just blow over that part of it. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a lot of skipping of pages going on here, right? <laughs> a lot of skipping of pages. So we've got to we've got to understand that and go back and really do some digging and understand how we need to fix the injustices, right? And why, you know, when you think of well, why is this community living this way why and when you look like oh this system was created with redlining right with some of the affirmative action folks things that were created with um some of the practices of giving gi bills and and, and blacks weren't able to access their gi bills and loans were given to whites and not blacks you, you got to understand that entire history and how we created these pockets of poverty so I said that's a deep question because there's so much unlearning that has to happen. And that's the work that we've been doing at the Urban League. We've been helping folks like yourself, white boys like yourself, but not just white boys, organizations, right? Because this goes beyond just white men. This goes, this is an entire system that has been ingrained in our American history. So we mm. have to understand it. We have to understand when we talk about systemic racism, how it impacts everyone, regardless of your socioeconomic um, background. Even if you're rich, you still, and black, you still are impacted by racism. And so mm. it's that understanding, that learning and that willingness to relearn and say, okay, now I'm going to take this learning and I'm going to make change. I'm going to make change. I'm going to look at my own practices. I'm going to look at my own organization and make sure that I don't repeat history. And how can I change that? And that's the, I think that's the commitment that folks have to make first. It's the personal work. It's what can I do? Can I check out my own biases, right? And my bias, let me look at my circle. Do I even have people that don't like, look like me in my circle? What kind of conversations are we having at the table? Do we talk about how racism impacts everyone? 
Do we talk about how I can help? And so those are the things we have to do that personal work and then do some learning and unlearning. And then that's the work. So that's what I would say to any person listening, white, black, um, any race, I would say you got to do that personal work and do and, and get a understand and, and understand the historical context, understand your own personal beliefs and values, understand what changes you need to make, and then you can begin to do the digging in and inform mm. others. Mm. A lot. Whoa. Yeah. It's, Whoa. It's, it's a lot. That's that was it. a good question. Because it's, it's, it's hard to know, right? I mean, um, it, we're now talking about the multi-generational workforce, right? Um, the millennials, the Gen Zers. What do you know from your generation as a, as a Black woman comparatively to the younger generations? Have you started to notice that they don't see racism or do they still see it very transparently and very upfront? Like, have we noticed any difference between the generations whatsoever? So first of all, I am a self elected millennial. I tell my staff that all the time. They, they laugh the same way you laugh, Kevin and Tyler. <laughs> Self-elected. <laughs> I am a millennial. I yes. want to be. <laughs> but I, first of all, you know what? One thing that I could say about the millennials is they are going to let you know how they're feeling. Um, they, they call things out. They will call things out when they see injustice. That's one thing that I'm really inspired, that they are just fearless. They don't care who it is, but they will call it out when they see an injustice. And so I, I appreciate that and I, I'm inspired by that. Um, so that's one thing that I've learned about them. And we, when we are working with our millennials, they most certainly see racism, but they are um, passionate about doing their part to eliminate it. Um, and that's what's so inspiring because they are not afraid to get their hands dirty. They are ready to be out in the street doing the work, you know, and sometimes I'm like, okay, you guys got that. I'm, I'm not, mm -mm, not going to do that, but they are ready and, and ready for whatever. And I like that about them. Us, I should say, I like that about us. Us, us yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> oh, <there's more. laughs> us millennials. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna kind of wrap up. Obviously, Dr. Chanel um, has uh, been a part of the as an executive director now for just I think under two years or just hit It'll two years. It'll be two years on June third. So coming up, you and I met very shortly after you first started. We did. Over. Um, but you, you, you're really looking to build bridges. You're looking to get out in the community. You're really looking to take your, your position of leadership and really improve the lives, not only of your employees, but the community that, in which you serve. And I think that's so amazing. Um, it really is your purpose. You can tell it the second you start talking about some of these topics, your face lights up. I got excited. I got goosebumps right. a couple of times there. Um, <laughs> when you, you want to close your doors in 50 years. I would love to see that um, by 2050 yeah. myself. Um, but it's, 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 it's make looking inward in ourselves and what things we need to change on an individual level to improve the lives of everybody else. Um, so as we wrap up, Dr. Shawnell, um, you've probably been conducting some, some interview, interviews yourself. You've been a part of some of these interviews. I'm sure the board ran down a list. They might have not ran down a list like uh, the stereotypical interview questions. But Tyler, what is your first interview question for Ms. Shawnell? Well, Ms. Shawnell. Um, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Oh, did you see how I sat up? I kind of sat up when you got into the interview questions. Like, okay, let me get my <laughs> interview <phase on. laughs> um, If I had one superpower, I would say I would want that rope that Wonder Woman has, that lasso to get people to tell the truth because I want to know what it is and what you're thinking. And I need folks to really demonstrate their integrity and tell the truth. So I, I need that. That's my superpower that I could just whip that out my invisible rope and make folks. Tell <laughs> well, that's, that's amazing. I would love to have that same thing because I think sometimes we go into conversations and like, does that person have a hidden agenda? Are they yes, trying to you want to know that? I would like to know that. And All I right. Would well, first put the rope around America to make America tell the truth <laughs> about history. Yeah, tell I, I might be truth. scared. No yeah. skipping pages. No skipping pages. All right. Well, uh, uh, Miss Shawnell, uh, since you're looking to, to work for our organization here at Time Out for Leaders, uh, we would like to know what is your greatest strength, but also what is your greatest weakness? 
Oh, my greatest strength. Um, that's a good question. My greatest strength is that I'm very strategic. I'm very strategic and, and I know how to get my team focused on target with the shared vision. I do that very well. Now, what was the other part of the question? I missed that. I'm sorry. What is your greatest weakness? I guess I don't listen well. I don't know. Oh, my <laughs> no, my my greatest weakness would be, um, yeah, I don't like to hear a no. I don't like to hear no. You know, I'm, I'm working for that. Yes, if that's something that I'm determined to do, we're gonna get there. And 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 so. When can you start? <laughs> well, I'm back in 50, I can start because all right, I close the organization. <laughs> well, I, I know that I have learned an absolute ton. Um, probably got five or six pages of notes here. Um, a lot Thank to think you. about, a lot to digest. But I cannot believe uh, uh, um, some of the things that we were able to kind of discuss about you. I learned, uh, again, a lot about your story, a lot about your journey. And these are things that in our community, people probably walk by you all the time and just assume that, oh, she was given that job. But no, nope, you worked really hard um, through your entire life with the time management. But I love your pieces on transparency, building, building bridges, and really looking how you can improve the lives of everybody. Um, so I just want to, I, I sincerely want to thank you so much, Dr. Shaw, now for being a special guest for us here on uh, Time Out with Leaders um, and really sharing your, your views with, with us and our, our, our listeners. This was so enjoyable. I am honored to have shared this space with both of you, both of you, Tyler and Kevin. I really appreciate it. this. Was fun. I really, I, I love this interview. This was probably my best interview. And I know if I want to work with two fun people, I know who I'm coming to. Yeah, you know who to call. You know <laughs> I know who to call. To call. For yes, sure. for sure. Well, thank you for that. And uh, that's that's the whole purpose of this show um, is, is really we want to showcase great leaders. So uh, and, and you know that you've been a mentor of mine since you first started there at the Urban League. So second I met you, I was like, this lady's different. And she seems to <laughs> <laughs> I like this lady. That's but, Queen uh, Supreme. Uh, Queen <laughs> Supreme. Yeah, you let Tyler and I know when that debut is, whether it's on the 21st or not. We're, we might ask. We might ask to see Queen Supreme. But Thank you again so much uh, for being Thank on the show. <laughs> All right, we're, now the show's over.